What is up, y'all? Welcome back to the channel. It's time for episode seven of Tiger's Franchise. Two months after episode six, I sincerely apologize for that. Work's been absolutely crazy. Kind of burning the candle at both ends with the fan graphs and the OTP job, plus trying to stream. And honestly, kind of the first thing that hits the back burner there is the YouTube series. And my apologies for that. Thank you to all of you who reached out uh, on various channels, whether it was on Twitter, in my stream, in my Discord, wondering what was going on, making sure everything was all right, asking about the dogs. I appreciate all of that. Um, and I have no intention of abandoning this series. Hopefully you've been watching P.F. Holden's Tiger series. He's been doing an excellent job with it. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything there for anybody who's not caught up in, you know, to the latest episode, especially I don't know when y'all are going to watch this, but we're back. And when we last left, we were 56 and 33, sitting nice here atop the division. Actually, I don't have to go to the standings. We can see right here, Big Ten game lead. We are we are way ahead of schedule here. It is 2024, and we are already toting a 10 game lead going into the draft. This feels pretty good right now. This is going to be a prospect focus episode because we're going to do the draft and then we're either going to do the draft itself, depending on how long that takes, and then a on the farm report for episode eight or combine the two. I'd like to combine the two and I got to be honest, there's a good chance we can do that because this draft is simply not that deep. Um, you look at it here and just going off of our scout, you got three blues and five greens. And what that means is, you know, three guys above 70 or 70 or better potential and then five that are 55 to 65 and so you know we just call them by the color if you're a blue or a green you're supposed to be kind of a star quality player or better and of course that doesn't mean that a bunch of these yellows can't turn into studs and we hope to draft some of them and with our coaching staff make them great but it's one of the thinner drafts and we know that the um the quote unquote real life drafts, because these are populated with a lot of real prospects that the game puts in uh, off the bat, these are often lighter drafts. And then when the computer generated ones come through, that's when things kind of kick into high gear. So we're still a couple years from that. I want to say there's at least this one and next one. And then the first computer generated, I believe, is 26. So we're, we're a good ways away from that. But we'll make the best of it. And we're going to be able to do that because we have the number three pick. We moved up in the lottery from 10 to 3, which honestly, this couldn't have been a better year to do that. Uh, well, actually, I'm sure there could have been a better year if there was like, you know, some generational guys up at the top. But with only three blues, we're guaranteed at least one of them. Assuming we trust our scout and we think that's the way to go, we're getting at least one of them. We're at least going to be able to get a green and we'll see how the rest of the league values these guys. Maybe we get a second. Who knows? I wouldn't bet on it. Uh, the thinness of this draft has me believing that we'll, we'll take our one and we'll be happy with it. So at the top there, you see Connor Griffin, Conrad Kaysen, and Michael Mullinax. Those are the three. I've got experience with Mullinax in many different uh, sims. And part of me wants to maybe lean away from him because I have had him in, in so many drafts. Part of me wants to go right back to him because he's been so good to me as a switch hitting, usually very strong defender with a quality bat. This pan out, uh, if he's able to get there, would be one of the better bats. He's usually kind of a defensive first with like a capable bat. This has a chance to be a game changing bat with quality defense, best used in a corner, but certainly capable to handle center. His speed profile isn't necessarily that great. Yes, he is very fast there with the 70 speed, but the 65 stealing, you, you wanna be careful there, uh, stealing too much with a guy whose speed rating is higher than his stealing rating. Cause don't forget speed isn't just about their raw speed and you know, beating out double plays and things like that or, or infield singles. It's also the frequency with which they are going to try to steal. And then you have the success of their stealing uh, as, as actual stealing there. And then base running is, you know, first to third, second to home, things like that. Actually, I wonder, is base running actually beating out double plays and infield hits? Uh, I might have that wrong. At any rate, the devs are aware that the speed profile isn't terribly intuitive. And I believe there are plans to work on that. I don't know if it's for 25 or not. I don't want to speak out of turn there, but hopefully we get a little bit more, uh, you know, intuitive format there because I think a lot of people look at it 
and the assumptions that they make would make sense but then in practice they don't exactly play out that way and it might lead to some bad decisions so we'll see how that goes with mullen x conrad or connor griffin here 70 power obviously this could be absolutely game changing big time personality as well not much for the defense definitely a corner uh has some infield capability I mean, it's loose uh, to where he's a potential 43rd baseman. That's not going to do a whole lot for us with Griffin. But we can worry about the defensive piece and where he's going to fit years down the line. He's 18 right now. We're going to be trying to develop that bat if we take him and go from there. And then Conrad Kaysen is kind of the in-between the two, I would say, uh, where his bat isn't as good as as Griffin's and his defense isn't as good as Mullinax's. Is, is, is. Uh, he's an infielder with second and short. And he's not great at either, but he does have high work ethic. Sure, he has high financial ambition. That doesn't ever really bother me that much. Of course, you'd love to save money and keep things cheap. But if a guy's earning it, I'll pay him. I have no problem with that. And then the loyalty's there too. So if we do pay him, if we do offer up, uh, it looks like he'll stick around. Now he's an old 17 year old, but hey, He's on, he's on that 17 side. He is the youngest of the trio here, Mullinax being the oldest. Uh, so we have to sweat what the Nats and White Sox are going to do, both of whom moved up. KC got screwed. So did Colorado. They both moved down from one and two, respectively, to five and four there. KC at five from one and Colorado at four from two. So let's just get into it. Let's see how this draft is going to go. Let's get it started here with Washington. I believe they're picking top five for the second straight year, right? Because they picked uh, uh, three the year before here. Or no, no, two. We picked three, duh. So we're picking three back-to-back -back seasons. Let's see what happens here with the first pick. They're going to take Ethan Murray. So none of the guys that we had. Wow. Okay, Ethan Murray. Let's take a look here. And he's got that huge power. So you can easily see how... Okay. He's 90 uh, potential. He's not on my board because he has a low work ethic. So there it is. Let's take. Let's turn off the filter real quick. Let's just see. Oh, wait, no. It is off. So why wasn't he showing? Oh, you know what? He might have been an impossible. Well, he's also not a draft target. Never mind. That's why he wasn't on it. I'm a doofus. But yeah, let's see if there's anybody else up there. I automatically weed out impossibles and low work ethic. I'm just not interested in either. First off, uh, I don't usually have the money to kind of throw around to try to get an impossible signability guy. Those are usually very, very difficult. And then as far as the low work ethic, it's just not something that I'm necessarily interested in at the top of the draft. There can be a place where, hey, this guy's got great power or 75 infield range, you know, 70 outfield range or something, but he has low work ethic. Okay, we can take one. But with a top five pick, first round pick even uh, really it kind of comes down to about the first four or five rounds that they're out of the picture for me so that's why we did not see ethan murray he was the clear number one here with a 90 potential even better than griffin has that 75 pop so while i don't love the low work ethic and adaptability i certainly don't blame the nats for taking him at number one not a great defender at short there straight 55s down the line so you definitely want to move him off maybe second or third but they can worry about that down the line he is fresh uh as an 18 year old just 35 days on june 6th there so just over a month he's got a long way to go they got plenty of time to kind of work with him let's see where the white Sox go our division rivals here they will take Mullinax. Okay, so they keep us, uh, you know, they kind of make the decision for us a little bit with regards to Mullinax because I really was leaning him and I think I was going to go ahead and gravitate back toward him because of the good feelings that I have, but that's okay. We can try something new and I have no problem with that, but I do like seeing the 60 range and 65 arm out there in the outfield. That would have been nice, but okay. So now we have our two blues here. We have Connor Griffin and Conrad Kaysen. Both have high work ethic. Kaysen is younger at 17, but again, let's not overstate that. He's basically 18, and Griffin himself is only 78 days into his age 18 year. So it's not like there's any major discrepancy here. And frankly, even if it was, you know, recently 17 years old and middle or later 18 years old, that wouldn't move the needle that much for me. What might move the needle, though, is the financial piece here. Griffin wants that bag at 9.5 mil. Meanwhile, Kaysen's at 360,000. That is such a massive discrepancy um, that I don't think is matched by the talent discrepancy here. Yes, you see 10 potential on the contact. That's a big deal. 15 on the gap. 
that's a big deal. And five on the home run. You know, there are differences here as to why Griffin ranks higher than Kaysen. Totally get it. But then you start to move further down the profile. And by the way, I'll point out, you know, a 10i edge as well for Griffin. But then you get to the Ks. It's actually 10 in favor of Kaysen. You get to the speed and the infield range. Those both lean toward Kaysen. The outfield range is plus five over to Griffin. Uh, and then the overall defensive profile at their primary position does go 10 points to Griffin there. Is it worth essentially nine, nine plus million dollars? I don't know. I don't think so. I really, really don't. Um, I'm just not sure that that there's enough difference there. You know, if this was a 60 range for Kaysen, I think it'd be a snap pick. But um, obviously it's not. So it, it's not yet a snap pick here. Let's see what our scout thinks. They like Griffin. Yep, they're just going with the best saying, hey, just go, you know, go, go for the big top, uh, the big dog here with the huge power and everything. Boy, I'm really not sure I agree because uh, that financial piece is massive here. I don't think we have any like extra picks. There's nothing in the supplemental. We move down to pick 13 in round two. Why all the way down to 13? If we were 10, oh wait, wait, wait. There's comp picks, three comp picks right there. 10 plus three, do that math in my head, carry the nine, divide that. It is 13, okay, makes sense. And then we are around nine here for who knows what reason, because there's also a comp pick. Uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Bottom line is, do we want to go big on Griffin at nine and a half mil or take the bargain and then maybe get somebody more expensive down the road uh, that, that might fall? I think I want to go Kaysen, y'all. I'm going to be really curious to see how y'all feel in the comments on this one. But I really think I'm leaning case and it, the money is just way too disparate for me to think that Griffin's the better pick here. Yes, he's the better player. He is, or at least potential. Um, he has the better profile. I don't disagree with that. But is it, is it, the, is it that much better that it's worth the financial discrepancy? I'm not seeing it. I am, I am a little bit moved by the fact that Connor Griffin's third best comp is a guy named Ballplayer Higby. That's an amazing name. Uh, I want to put Ballplayer Higby into Perfect Team tomorrow <laughs> because what a, what an amazing name. You got Yusniel Diaz too. I, I, man, I fell for Yusniel Diaz. And when I sell, say fell for, it just means I liked him as a prospect and he didn't pan out. That is, Fell for is kind of an unfair way to put it because like, he didn't, he didn't dupe me in any way. He just didn't pan out. That happens to hundreds of prospects. By the way, I'm looking over here. Scroll down a little bit further. Number nine comp for Conrad Kaysen is Ballplayer Booth. Which is the cooler name? Ballplayer Higby or Ballplayer Booth? I think it's got to be Higby, right? Because Higby's kind of cool. Higby. I don't know. I'm, I'm rambling here. I'm still trying to agonize over this. I think, think I'm going Kaysen, y'all. Wait, what is this now? What is this scouting? Is this OSA? It sure is. And they like Griffin as a 115. Then they move Henry Allen up. They move Kaysen all the way down here. Now, this is kind of interesting to see. I don't often look at OSA, and I see this here, and this, this creates a different dynamic. By the way, you also see a few more blues and a hell of a lot more greens. Our scout doesn't agree, though. And I tend to lean with our scout, Mark Connor here. You know, when I, when I hire a scout... I'm interested in what they've got going. I'm usually going to go with their word here. So I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust you, Mark. And I'm going to take Case in here, who you believe isn't that far off of Griffin. And, and we're going to do it. I, I like this guy uh, being named DM Jefferson. The best era to be named DM, right? Like everyone knows that as direct message and all that, I'm sure. That that's not what his name is be kind of interesting if it is but that's a kind of a cool time it's a cool time to have that as your name because it's kind of in the culture but it doesn't matter right now that's not who we're picking we're gonna go ahead and take conrad case in let me know if you think i've made a total mistake here nine and a half mil to three hundred sixty thousand. i just think it's far too uh different too much better for case in to not take to not take him so there we go we'll do the top 10 here colorado takes Connor Griffin, 
Kansas City takes Derek Curiel. I was actually kind of looking at him, hoping maybe that he would fall because I love that defense out there. He would have been very expensive, though, at 12 mil. So I don't know if we'd have necessarily gone for it if he had fallen, but at least would have been a fun decision. Then you got Peyton Stovall at seven, Will Taylor at eight, Tommy White at nine. Tommy White deserved a better role here. I think he's going to be an absolute monster in real life, but uh, not so much here. Wait, is that? am I thinking of the right guy? Am I thinking of the right guy here? Because I said North Carolina State. I'm thinking of the um, the LSU guy. Is that is his name not Tommy White? Am I thinking of somebody else here? Just searching Tommy is probably not the smartest move I made because there's a hell of a lot of Tommies. There's this one. No, this is the guy. I'm an idiot. Is that not his name? No, this is killing me. I have to look this up. Tommy White, LSU. Yeah, that's Tommy White. So why is it saying NC State here? Is it the same guy and they just kind of kind of goofed it? I wonder if that's the case. Let's see. March 2nd, 2003 is when he was born. March 2nd, 2003. Okay. But why is it saying NC State? Who knows? Does it matter? Absolutely not. Move on, Paul. <laughs> New York picks DM Jefferson. I wonder if they private messaged him to, uh, I should have said direct message because that's what DM stands for, but I was trying not to be as on the nose there with that stupid joke, and it failed. It failed. All right, so there's the top 10. Take a look at it again real quick here. You got Ethan Murray, Michael Mullinex. We took Conrad Kaysen, Connor Griffin, Derek Curiel, Peyton Stovall, Will Taylor, Tommy White, allegedly from NC State, guess he transferred, and DM Jefferson for, for the Mets. Let's go to our next pick, see what falls. All right, greens are gone. We are into the yellows, folks. OSA believes that there's still a blue o Owen Pano, who, I mean, if he is that good, watch out. But so interestingly, OSA does not like his defense much, but they love his bat. You flip to our guy, Mark Connor, and he says, defense a little bit better, bat not nearly that good. Um, so yeah, there's better guys according to OSA. We're still going to lean on our guy here. What does he think? Connor likes us to take Duncan Marston. I don't know, man. That's two last names. I don't know if I can if I can get with that. Harvard Westlake. Oh, my God. Did you know? <laughs> Not many people know this, okay? So this is kind of a tidbit that you won't hear anywhere but here on Paul Spohr's YouTube channel. But did you know that Max Freed... Lucas Giolito and Jack Flaherty all went to Harvard Westlake. I'm, just, I'm joking, of course. If you watched ever watched a game with any of those three in it or tangentially related to the game, they mention it. It's baseball's version of Matt Stafford and Clayton Kershaw were friends in high school. Uh, we got it. Get something new, announcers. We got it. Anyway, moving on to our second round pick. By the way, I also meant to mention that, look, we have the Shark Cam back to readjust it there as she adjusted in the bed but um so when we first had the shark cam my tower was over here everything was connected easily and we could do it well then i rearranged everything and i put the tower on this side of the desk because it just worked better for everything but it kind of took away shark cam because i can't drag the camera all the way over here it just wasn't working the cord wasn't long enough i rearranged everything got a new like desk organizer thing reset everything moved the tower back over and we got dog cam again. So, you know, you might be mad about how long it took me to make this episode, but at least dog cam is back in the picture. All right, so looking at Marston, I, you know, I just got done, not necessarily gassing you up, Mark Connor, but saying how much I trust you, I believe in you. And you come with this reco here, and this is crap, okay? Maybe he's just influenced by the fact that all of those prestigious pitchers went to Harvard Westlake, but this is a dog shit recommendation, man. I'm not, I'm not taking Duncan Marston. Get out of here with that. Get. What about Jackson Sanders? Let's look at him a little bit here. Don't love that movement at 40. He's intelligent and well-spoken, apparently. You know, he's got the four pitches. Uh, the curve and the changeup could be pretty excellent. He's a lefty, 18 years old. You know, he's in consideration. 
does want eight and a half mil. Rock Regio, I've seen Rock Regio usually with more pop and thus uh, more appealing. This is pretty bland and he can play around the field a bit, uh, infield, outfield. You know, he's not great at any of it, but okay, you know, it's a benefit and he's cheap too. You know, if you really just want to go mad cheap and kind of keep keep going that route here with another pick and then again you start looking you see some if there's any multi-million guy that falls is there how many are left okay there's a handful left uh and if we wanted to maybe sign one later maybe we could but we're not just going to go cheap to be cheap they have to be good players too Jasada brown uh just doesn't have the catching now you see 21 year old here a bit more put together with some uh, orange and yellow in the profile uh, on the current, meaning that you know they're not just the standard 20s that you see from a lot of the high school prospects. Leader in work ethic, but I just can't get behind it with a 45 catcher ability. You know, it, it, we're talking that if this is a 55, 60 catcher ability, I, I'm taking Jasada Brown easily. And I have moved Jasada Brown off of catcher before, tried to work them in, I wanna say at third base, and, and it was okay. It was not a resounding success. So doesn't mean it wouldn't wouldn't succeed here, but I'm not su super keen on trying it again. Matthew Champion, blah. Let's actually look at the pitchers as a whole here. Shift over to pitching. And Josh Hartle. Now Josh Hartle's developed and, and kind of good now. Side armor, 89 to 91. Lefty out of Wake Forest. I don't think a second round pick. If, if Hartle's there in the third, I'd maybe start to consider it more, but a little blah for a second round pick. Drew Graham, pretty blah. I mean, again, this is a thin draft. It, honestly, I should be going quicker because of the lack of impact in the draft, but it's almost like when it's all kind of similar like this, it can almost be harder to make a pick because you're trying to split hairs. You're like, I don't even know who to pick. So on the one hand, you can say, well, just pick anyone because... How different are they? And on the other, it's like, oh God, I'm trying to find somebody to land on and I'm paralyzed by the choice, you know, by all the sameness of choices. But I'm looking here at Jack McCowan, Jake McCowan, excuse me. And I think this might be our guy. Four pitch mix, straight 55s down the line on stuff, movement control for the potential, 91 to 93, age 18, you know, still a couple of months away from, from turning 19. Not great stamina at 45, but can certainly still start. Yeah, there's some things to like here. Dominated in high school, which is great. Average level of competition. I don't always get too hung up on the stats uh, for the draft prospects, but as uh, my editor Kim has talked about, they like to leverage the stats, especially later in the draft, and they find some good picks with it. So I tend to have ignored it in the past. I want to get away from just fully ignoring it and at least bringing it in, folding it into the mix of consideration. Ryan McPherson, control artist, sitting 89, 90, or 88 to 90. Great personality there with the adaptability, work ethic, and intelligence. Low leader and loyalty. I, I've never been too bothered by that. You don't need everyone to be a, uh, a leader, and you don't need them to necessarily be loyal. If you pay them, they should usually stick around, but uh, I'm not too bugged out by that. Four pitch mix, uh, 55 stam. I, I love that they're a control artist. So I, I really am intrigued here. It's honestly between him and McCowan. Let's see here. Hmm. Do we go control artist or maybe probably a higher upside, I think, with McCowan? I don't know. I'd say, what do y'all think? But this isn't a stream, it's a video. I do like streaming drafts because you bounce off, I bounce ideas off the chat and everything that certainly helps. Interestingly here, their com comparison players are all the same. And there's another amazing name, Buckshot May, Dick Tur Tur Willinger, Tur Willinger, Wilking Rodriguez. I mean, these are amazing names for the comparisons. I'm again getting bogged down in things that don't matter. But yeah, I mean, if you just look at the, the comparison here, you only get in the stuff movement control uh, and I guess the stamina there. 
you know, the 45s down the line, or excuse me, 55s down the line, or 45, 45, 65. Stamina favors McPherson by 10. That does not move the needle that much for me, though. You know what? I think I'm going to go McCowan. And then, oh, McCowan, 7 mil. McPherson is slot. Oh, man. Jackson Sanders would be the pitching recommendation. I looked at him, didn't I? Why, why did I dismiss him if I did look at him? Wait, I think Jackson Sanders has to be in the mix here. Yeah, it's 8.5 mil, but we still have 14 mil left. Like we're not going to spend all that. I think we can go I think we can go more expensive here. I'm actually I'm actually kind of uh pivoting all the way over to Jackson Sanders. The movement's a little light for sure, but I think we have a park that we can hide it. I think I did look at. Did I? 70 No, no. The the picture I looked at Who who did I look at that had 70 70? on uh curveball changeup. why can't i remember like five minutes ago god i'm a thousand years old and we got a little two-way action here too with jackson sanders i mean it's not much with the bat but 60 power potential I, actually i shouldn't say it's not much if you can hit for 60 power 55 gap with 50 i that's something so let, let me not dismiss that now i have a horrendous track record of developing two two-way players so that might not go anywhere but it's a nice little side bonus if something happens with the pitching you know what we're going jackson sanders here we're going to pay up the money they want eight and a half jackson you got it done third pick coming in everyone's still there mcpherson wait did mccowan go oh wow so the draft like mccowan more than sanders or excuse me more than uh, mcpherson let's see where they went uh, McCowan, McCowan, McCowan. Mc Jake McCowan. I think I might have said Jack again because I'm thinking of Jack McKeon, former manager. Um, this is OSA again. Okay, so that's why. Because OSA really likes McCowan. Let's see what OSA thinks of McPherson compared to our guy. So they think he's even more of a control artist with some better stuff. Interesting. OSA likes this draft so much more than our guy. He's, he's on the Duncan Marston thing again. Uh, stop it. I'll fire you on the spot, my man. I, I won't. That's bullshit. But, like, stop. It's annoying, you know? Let's look back at the hitters. Oh, my God. We're down to three yellows now i am only showing my draft list that's why everyone's capitalized let's let's clear that real quick just to see you know what sort of low work i think guys might be lingering there is marston who didn't make my list he's the last green available because i looked at the profile and i'm like first base only already at 19 with 50 power like no absolutely not nolan traeger is this chris traeger's kid i literally would take him if he had 60 catcher ability and high work ethic. But as it stands, no thanks. Let's go back to our, wait, Elijah Dukes. Is this Elijah Dukes' kid? Is, is that, or is that the actual Elijah Dukes like re-registering for the draft somehow? Elijah Dukes, man, could have been a dude, had a lot of off the field issues. Um, that I don't know. I don't think he ever really got his life in order. Unfortunately, he was a very talented player for the Rays. I want to say maybe the Nats as well. Hang on, let me scroll down. Yeah, the Nats, uh, but just never, never kind of got things going. But what's interesting, you know, he's from Florida. He played for Tampa Bay, and then you look here and we see Tampa, Florida. I mean, has to be right. Oh yeah, and then you go Elijah Dukes, and you hit. Uh, space the autocomplete says sun because I think yeah yeah it's uh wait wait, wait. no 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 Elijah Dukes Jr. he the 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 Rays player is Elijah Dukes Jr. it says let me look here perfect game profile boy he kind of looks like him too a little bit in the face I it's gotta be right it's gotta be um 
Well, now I just don't know. Does it really matter? Probably not. But am I really interested in finding out? Okay, so wait. 2008 holds his three-year-old son, Elijah Jr. Okay, so I was wrong earlier. It, it, I would show you my screen, but it labeled Elijah Dukes Jr. as the 39-year-old. But no, apparently the player that we were looking at is Elijah Dukes Jr. I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm not taking him, so I don't know why I'm wasting my, my time on that. Anyway, I just wanted to bring up Elijah Dukes, the former ball player, kind of look in to see what he was doing. So my apologies here. Dude, I, I hope Jack Caglione kind of pops off this year for Florida, or this year, I mean 2024 in uh, in real life, because watching him in the College World Series this past year, he's a two-way player, absolute monster. He doesn't get any good dice rolls, and I, I don't know, I think he's supposed to be a dude, but maybe not. Maybe I got drunk off of the, uh, the big College World Series because every sim I've had this year, he's been kind of, kind of nothing. Um, and you can see here, kind of all or nothing power. The pitching isn't really there. And I'm not sure that he's going to be a two-way in real life, like when, when push comes to shove and he graduates. But I think he's supposed to be like a legit-ass hitter at the very least. Anyway, who we take? We're going back to the pitchers. I don't think these hitters are worth getting into here. And we're going to take McPherson, I think. We were considering him pretty heavily last round until we made, it way, made our way back to Jackson Sanders. Take a look at Drew Graham here. These pitches are really developed for an 18 year old. I like that a lot. Left hander with high work ethic. Wants 2.2 mil. Let's take a look at who OSA likes better. If for no other reason than to maybe get an idea of who might be their next pick. So you see McPherson and then uh, Graham was the other guy, right? Like I said, I have squirrel brain. I can't remember nine seconds ago. Yeah, it was Drew Graham. So he's actually the top rated guy by OSA left. So if we're going off of that notion, maybe that's who we should take and then hope that McPherson makes it. I, I try not to get too drunk off of this uh, triple high right here, this adaptability, work ethic, intelligence. Big time sucker for seeing the triple green there. You know what, we're gonna go Graham. I think it's a more complete pitcher there. And is not McPherson the sidearm? No, no, who was the, there was a sidearmer earlier. Never mind, that's not him. But he's the soft tossing finesse control artist, which, I, which I'm fine with. We can make that work. We'll take, we'll take McPherson if he lasts another round. Probably won't, but we'll take the shot. We're gonna go Drew Graham here. Boom. Next round, McPherson gone, son of a gun. That's all right. It was one or the other. I, I don't think Drew Graham was making it either. So let's see here. We took Graham at pick nine. McPherson went just a couple picks later, which makes total sense. All right, here we are in the fourth round now. Recommendation is for Casey Sock 2. Uh, 2. The second. Casey Sock 2. The sequel. Like it's a damn movie title, you goofus. Anyway, uh... I don't know that that's who I'm interested in taking. I don't see a whole lot there. I maybe do want to venture back over to the hitting range, but I'm looking here at Bryce Navarre. And I see two potential 80 pitches via OSA. Let's go to our guy. He says there are a couple of 65s. He's got a little bit more of a measured outlook on it. 85 to 87 only, which is kind of brutal. You can add velo though, so I'm not that's not a deal breaker. I don't know. Let's look at the hitters real quick under OSA. They've got a few yellows and that's it. We have literally two yellows left according to our guy. Excuse me, <clears throat> got the hiccups. Not, there's never a time to get the hiccups because they're like the most annoying thing ever. Exhibit A, but particularly when you're recording a video. It can be pretty frustrating. So looking here at Jack Hurley, 22, so a bit advanced. Strikeout machine. I hate the plate profile here. 
I do like gap power. Now I like to play a lot of uh, perfect team as well. And gap power kind of gets short shrift in the perfect team world uh, because it's just not super impactful unless maybe you have a park to kind of favor it. But I think like the general consensus about it that it's like meaningless quote unquote i think that goes a bit too far in the perfect team realm and then i think maybe some folks who play both base game and perfect team might carry that notion over and then kind of give gap power um less consideration when they're doing their their base game play so i think you got to be careful with that and in a park like we play at in comerica gaps very important i ran my arizona diamondback sim earlier in the summer where you the gaps are great and you want gap power and guys like corbin carroll uh and and several others by the way it wasn't just him but he's the first guy you think of there right now they took so much advantage of it we had so many gap gods there and i think i think comerica allows us to do the same that said he still comes up a bit too short on the plate profile to take him right here jack hurley but he is somebody that if he's there next round i will take him I'm kind of looking at PJ Morlando here, even though it's a 40 catcher ability, which is awful. I don't want him catching anywhere. But I look and there's there's some left field capability, 40, 45, 55 in the outfield. And that's pretty dog shit too. But I can let him stand out there. And if he's hitting like this, I have no problem with it. It might be problem is it might be like DH off rip. And you're not you're not loving taking a DH, you know, day one here. What if we get a pitcher recommendation? It would be Zach Swanson. Outside of the low work ethic, that's actually not a bad reco. I don't know. Let's go back to the pitchers and take a look at them ourselves. Pop the OSA on real quick. They like Bryce Navarro, don't forget. And Navarro only falls to fourth with, uh, with Connor here. Mark Connor. Matthew Champion. Three pitch mix has to do a lot of work on the changeup. Big velo though for a 19 year old, 93 to 95. It's a bit light on the stuff movement at 45, 40 respectively, but 55 control, kind of like that. Little bit of two way capability as well in case, you know, you have to move down that avenue. You know what? I kind of like champion a bit more than Navarre. I know I said I was going to take uh, some hitter. Who, I would recognize their name if I saw it here. I, I said I was going to take, um, geez, who did I say? Because now I don't recognize. Was it, oh, it was Hurley. It was Hurley. I said if Hurley makes it, I'll take Hurley next round. I think I'm going to make a liar out of myself on that because I'm going to take champion. And then if Navarre makes it, I'm going to take him. So take champion now, and then it'll be Navarre, Hurley. So let's do that. We'll meet his demand. Skip to our pick. Navarre made it. Did Hurley. Hurley made it. Okay, so we got both. Let's see what Mark Connor thinks. He says Jake Oki or Joey Oki. Why did I say Jake? Joey Oki. That's not a bad reco. All right, you're getting better. Another low work ethic, though. You should know. You should just be able to read my mind that I don't want low work ethic. That's back to back low work ethic recos. But. Here we are now uh, in the in the fifth round. It's on the table. If the player is good enough, it's on the table. That said, I did say I would snap pick. Well, I said it for two players, so kind of already made a liar of myself on that. But I'm looking at Bryce Navarre, and I didn't realize he had a little bit of two-way capability too. So while OSA likes Navarre way more than our guy, I think I'm going to take him. And I'm going to see if OSA is right here because they also like his bat a good bit better. And maybe Mark's wrong on this one. And maybe Mark's right. And that's okay too, because it's still, you know, a light two way player that we can work with. I don't think it's the end of the world. Even if, even if Mark, uh, it happens to be right. Do we push it and try to get Hurley the next round? That is the question. Can any hitters pitch by the way? Oh, well, besides Caglione, I guess Lorenzo Carrier a little. Carlos Pena, is that Carlos Pena's kid? Yeah, so nothing really going there. Let's go back to the pitchers who can hit. You see Bryce Navarre there. He's definitely the best. In fact, he's really the only one. That's pretty much the last two-way. 
I will reiterate though that I'm not very good at developing two-way players. So that's not that's not the most appealing thing. It's cool and I'll continue to try and maybe there's some things I can try uh, to do better there. But I don't I don't race to take those guys because the success just isn't there. All right, let's take Navarre. I said that's who I was going to take if he made it. He did. Now, if Hurley makes it, I'm going Hurley. Did he make it another round? He did. Snap pick. I don't even want, I don't even want to be talked off of it by myself here. <laughs> Duncan Marston is still there. And that right there should get you fired, Mark. That he's still here in the seventh round, the guy you were recommending in like the second round. I know I'm talking to uh, you know a computer character who does not exist. I mean, I, he might be a real person. A lot of the personnel are real, uh, based off of real people. But I'm acting like he's here or something. Mar, get in here. All right, who do we like now? So we don't like Marston at all. It's a horrendous recommendation. Oki's still there. Okay, actually, I think we're gonna take a low work ethic guy because there's a lot to like here. And if we can kind of work through that, I think there could be something. Maybe Oki's driven enough to kind of put, well, because if you, no, not really, because if he was driven, that that's essentially having work ethic. Maybe he, what, what I mean to say is maybe he's just outright good enough. Maybe his raw talent is good enough that he doesn't have to put in that extra work. Or he just links up with some of our coaches that really, really like him and boom things happen. Joey Oki, our guy. All right. Now, what are we looking at here? Let's go all players. Let's go OSA, see how they're feeling. They still got four yellows on the board. And then Mark has just the one, just out of brown. I mean, I don't know. I was going to say I get it, but I don't think I really do because the 45 catcher ability is so bad. I guess it's a developed bat, relatively developed for 21, uh, that can catch ostensibly with high work ethic. I mean, there are things to like, but you know, I don't think I have much history of evolving players, um, catcher ability and, you know, and turning them from 45s into sixties or whatever. So I don't know, you know, I've got a little bit of a positive feeling toward Carl Hartman because of how well he panned out in our red series. Unfortunately, it wasn't on our team. We had traded him for Cody Morris, a, a real life favorite of mine, and Hartman became an absolute stud for Cleveland. Now, part of that might've just been Cleveland's development. You know, they're amazing at developing pitching in real life. Maybe that's carrying over to the game and he wouldn't have been as good with us, but man, I, I regretted that deal. They're not all gonna be bangers. You make a bunch of trades, you're gonna have some duds, but it's 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 relatively bland here. You know, 45's down the, down the line. But 260 pitches, 55 stamp, throws 93.95. Frankly, I don't really understand why at 93.95 with a 60, 60, 50 potential pitches, his why his stuff is only 45 potential. I, that does not make any sense to me. Uh, but I don't want to get too caught up in that and worrying about it. I'm just going to take him. Carl Hartman, welcome to the org. Wow, that's the last orange pitcher, according to Mark Connor at 35 then it's all red wow 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 this draft really dies off at least in the eyes of connor all right let's get to our next pick here it is now our ninth pick recommendation duncan marston no no it's alex kunzel who's you know yeah, just bland you know kind of okay at everything not great at anything it's the ninth round of the draft. That's what you're getting at this point. Let's go back to the batters. It's been a pitcher heavy draft for us. Let's see if we can find some standout skills. See a couple 60 powers here with Carter Graham and PJ Orlando. Now I was talking up PJ Orlando earlier, obviously scared off a little bit by the 40 catcher ability and the lack of any great defense elsewhere, though there could be something with some corner outfield. I might just take the big pop. There's Caglioni still too. Now, 30 avoid K is so horrendous. If he had some defense too, right? Like you think of two, oh wait, wait, wait. He can, he can hang in the outfield just like Morlando, even better. 45, 50, 55, which is fine for a left fielder. 
But I was going to say, you would think a two-way player would have the athleticism to be like a quality outfielder. Uh, but it's pretty bland. You know, I think I might take him, though. Again, really, really enjoyed watching him in the College World Series for Florida. Definitely seems like he should be somebody who's a big-time prospect next year. We didn't get a good dice roll here. But uh, let's take the shot on it. Sometimes you're just taking high upside skills at this point in the draft. And a lot of times I will look first and foremost at the power and just say, you know what? That's where we're going to go. Let's just take a big power bat. Sometimes it pans out in a big way. I'll, re I'll re reference our um, uh, Reds series yet again. Now, this wasn't a ninth round pick. This was, I think, third, maybe even second round. So it's not the same thing. But I took a guy named Luke Billings because he had like 70 potential power. Nothing else was really there. He developed into an absolute monster. But with that carrying tool of the 70 power, I was like, well, let's just see where that goes. Again, I think it was third round, maybe second. So that's a much earlier pick. But when you get later here, you find a carrying tool and you say, let's see what we can do with it. Like nobody has 65 infield range. That would be a tool that I'd see. There's a couple 60s. Um, there's a 70 range here in the outfield, but he has literally nothing else. So we're probably looking at Jaquan Smith down the line. Uh, I, I will take a shot if he, if he lasts just because of the speed and defense, but that's going to take some time. Um, it's going to need to be like the 15th round for him. All right, let's take Caglioni and see what happens. To the 10th we go. 10th round, 10th pick. Recommendation is Ben Hess. A solid pitcher, 21 years old, about to be 22 here in a couple months. Only 50, 40, 40 down the line there. But 93, 95 with four pitches that are pretty well developed. Of course, you want that for a college product who's about to be 22. You can't be coming in light on that aspect. Frankly, it's probably a bullpen piece, even with the four pitch mix, just because uh, the 40 movement, 40 control. But I mean, this is somebody we can send to double A off rip, you know, we should go Eastern League there just to get 100% what we're looking at. But yeah, I think uh, I think I like Ben Hess there. Let's do our due daily, make sure there's nobody else. And you're seeing, you know, just a bunch of yellow across the board here. Grant Cherry, 21 years old, bit younger than Ben Hess, kind of, kind of similar, just eh, fine. Carter Daniels, 21 years old, even younger, uh, 21 years and 50 days, 45, 45, 45. Decent pitches, 55 stam, throws 93-95. I think I like Carter Daniels better than Ben Hess and better than Grant Cherry. Austin Nye's got the big uh, the big profile with the high adaptability, work ethic, intelligence, and loyalty for that matter. And you know what? 18 years old as well, two months into his age 18 season. I think that's gonna be the tiebreaker. The profile and the age, let's get Austin Nye. Next up, our, our board is getting light here. You can see only about 12 pitchers left. But Cherry did make it. Go to the batters. We got more batters than we do uh, pitchers left. You know what? Let's take Cherry. We liked him last round as a consideration. We might as well jump back on it. They're still recommending Casey Sock the second here. And again, that's your second one uh connor that you're recommending for four rounds meaning the first time you recommended them was way too early ben hess is still there too i guess is he not on our board i'll put him on the draft targets he's, he's pretty decent if he's there next round we'll we'll go him he does rank higher actually 35 potential to cherry's 30. i like cherry a little bit more though I'm not really seeing where Hess gets the edge. Let's compare him real quick. 45. Uh, on the stuff there, it goes 5 to Hess. On the movement, it goes 10 to Cherry. And on the control, it goes 5 to Cherry. The stamina goes 10 to Cherry. Velo goes for Hess, but then it's extreme fly ball for Hess and neutral for Cherry. I I'm not seeing how they're not both probably 35s. And look, let's not quibble too much over a five discrepancy. These are rounded as well. 
it could be like 36 to 33 or something. All right, let's go Cherry. I like Cherry a little bit better. Auto pick there. Hess is still there. And we'll take Hess. Got them all. Pokemon style. All right, we got to get some hitters here. You know what? We have a 60 catcher ability this late. I don't really give a shit what the bat looks like. That This is a minor league catcher at the very least. Anson Araz, welcome to the Tigers. Next up here, we are in the 14th round. And PJ Morlando. Now, if I'm going to give Mark Carter, Connor a hard time for recommending somebody uh, who's then there several rounds later, then I'll clown myself. I was talking up Orlando several rounds ago because of that 60 power. Uh, you know, the 40 catcher ability is probably scaring off the rest of the league as well, and understandably so. Maybe we push it one more because I see a high work ethic Alexander Diaz here. Man, if he had 60 range, that extra five range would be so big right now. Ryan Bajwani is our only 60 range. By the way, looking at the timer here, I think it'll be just the draft, and then the next episode will be down on the farm, and then we'll get into the second half of the season there. So prospect fans, you're getting kind of back-to-back -back episodes here, really diving into where our farm system's at. Ethan Anderson, another 60 catcher ability with high leader, high work ethic. That might be our guy. What's our catching looking like across the org here? We've got three at um, at double A, none of whom can catch that well. They're all 50s. High A has Colin Burgess at 55, okay, and Manuel Garcia at 45, gross. Lakeland has four catchers. Oh yeah, Smithwick was our draftee, our, sup our supplemental brown pick last year. He's 55 ability. Michael Rothenberg, or Mike Rothenberg, 50 ability. He's 25 years old. He's already too old for that level for sure. Sergio Tapia, 50. Moises Valero, 50. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're taking another catcher here because we got Araz. Uh, Araz or Araz? Anson Araz. And with the 60, let's take Ethan Anderson as well. Let's get a couple 60s in the org. Because again, at the very least, they're working with our minor league pitchers through the system even if they don't make it to the majors. So yeah, let's do that. Let's jump down here to Anderson. Oh, actually there's another one. Renee Lastris, also a great personality. Well, let's compare the two. Homer Bush Jr., nice dude. Um, Homer Bush and I have had some combos on, on Twitter. Seems like a really nice guy. Remember him as a former utility player. All right, let's compare these two here. So the bats are, are equally uninspiring. There's no major edge there. And then it's 60 ability for both, but then a 10 arm difference in favor of Lastris, which I think makes him the pick. They're both 20. Yeah, let's take Lastris. And I'll tell you what, I'll say it again. We've been saying it on a lot of these uh, uh, you know, coin flip picks. Oh, wait, wait, wait. There's another one here. Gio Cueto. A third 60. Also has high work ethic. But only a 45 arm. I will still take Lastris because he has a 65 arm. But I might take another catcher after this. If they both make it. There's Cueto. There's Anderson. They both made it. We can probably wait. Usually, you know, 60, 60 catcher abilities do get snapped up. There's even another one down here, Jaden Melendez. So we can wait. There's three left. Uh, I'd be surprised if they all get taken. So let's just, uh, let's hold off on that. Got to utilize my back scratcher here real quick. As we continue on, let's see what the recommendation here is in round 15. Josh Harlow, Jack's brother, 23 years old. Uh, pretty developed as you would not only expect but require if you're taking a 23 year old it can't be a project uh, probably just an org pitcher meaning you don't have huge expectations of them making the majors uh, but they pretty much go to AAA day one which I'm okay with what's the AAA pitching looking like 
We've only got 16 there. That's okay. I usually like to keep it under 20 uh, because then guys just aren't getting enough innings. But like we've got we've got two red potentials. Uh, Brendan White at 35, Jace Fry at 30. Neither of whom have pitched this year either. So again, that's why you want to keep keep the uh, the the volume down a little bit on how many players you've got down there, or else there's just not enough innings, and they're not pitching the two crummy guys, which makes some sense. Jace Fry really is, uh, you know, 31 years old, and that 35 control is probably not going to change. That's somebody we could probably cut. But we don't have to worry about that right now. Bottom line, I just wanted to see if taking a Josh Harlow, putting him in double-A or triple-A makes some sense. I think double-A, because we don't need him in triple-A, but then maybe triple-A next year, and then maybe he kind of connects with our our, uh, our management down there. I really, really wish you could still check relationships. Or I, I, stay, I say still, I shouldn't say that as if it's ever been uh, a thing. I wish you could check relationships before you draft somebody, before you pick them up. You know, I'd love to know if Dusty Crawford likes, uh, what the hell was his name? God, I just forgot his name. Harlow, God. It is a bit late here, but that's not an excuse. I'm just an old dumbass. But yeah, you can't really see that. It would be cool if you could know, but that's fine. I think we'll take him and we'll see how it goes. Auto pick. Recommendation is for Hunter Hines. Pretty modest hitter. What do we got left on the hitting side? Morlando's still there. Let's get some defense. Jaquan Smith can probably be our last pick at 22. He offers nothing with the bat. He has that 70 range and 75 speed. So I'm still keeping an eye on him for lately. What about Homer Bush Jr.? 65 outfield range. Really good defender, high work ethic, not much of a bat. Maybe we could develop it. He is 22 on the verge of 23. I mean, he's still a few months off, uh, 272 days, but, you know, pretty close. And I bring that up because, you know, when they're at, at the elevated age, you have to be honest about how much you can realistically expect them to develop. Honestly, with Bush, we'd be hoping maybe to add some fives on like the eye and avoid K. Maybe just kind of maybe can make the plate skills a bit better so they can get on base a little bit uh, with that great defense in the outfield. Jace Barofen. Also saw him in the fall, uh, not the fall league. I'm, I'm so used to talking about prospects in the fall league, which I'm going to in November again this year. Can't wait. But uh, in the College World Series, I think it's Borfin or Borofin, ibuprofen. Let's just call him that. It's easy. Tyree Reed, gap god, decent defender, a little small ball profile with the sack bunt, bunt for hit. We don't sack bunt around these parts though. It's just not my style. Carlos Pena is still there with the sixty pop too. I think at this point, I could take a sixty power and just say, hey, it is the sixteenth round. Can we develop the 60 power and just hope? Ty Evans here also has a 60 pop. I think he might be better than Pena. Let's compare him. Equal contact. Uh, Ty Evans has plus five on the gap. Equal home run. Equal I. Equal avoid K. Better speed profile for Evans. Defense. Goes to Evans as well. Yeah, what? Well, so, okay. Looking at all of this, why is Pena five higher on the potential 35 to 30? And I'll reiterate what I said last time I, I did this. It's rounded, so it might be even closer than this, but like, why is it not definitively Evans? What am I missing? I don't get it. Like this one, this one just doesn't check out. I don't know, doesn't matter. Let's take Evans. Oh wait, that's uh, Reed. Ty Evans, welcome. All right, a couple more picks here. Might as well just finish out the draft. Hunter Hines is still there. That was a recommendation a round or two ago. 
Let's actually turn off our list here. Let's just see if there's anybody that stands out that I didn't. Uh, oh, I doubt there's any impossibles left, but let's just look. Oh, there are. Wow, there's four impossibles. Cameron Davis, Albert Craig, M Mason Brassfield, and Connor Barth. Was there not a Connor Barth? Was that not like a kicker? Why do I recognize that name? Football place kicker, Connor Barth for Tampa Bay. Boom. I remember the dumbest shit. I've made fun of myself for not being able to remember like five minutes ago, multiple times in this video. But sure, I remember a random ass kicker from the 2000s. So that's pretty cool. Is this his kid? Um, hard to say. Connor Barth, the kicker from North Carolina, went to North Carolina. I don't know if he still lives there. Played in the league last in Chicago. Could have, you know, could have moved out to California. Who knows? Who can say for sure? Spells the name differently, though, too. Uh, E-R versus O-R. Anyway. Low work ethic, but at this point, you know, who cares? But I, I'm not taking him. I don't think he's that good. If, if you're going to sign an impossible, they have to have a reason, right? Like, Elbert Craig, why are you impossible? Unless you're impossible because you're definitely going to college unless somebody, like, just overpays you because you know you need to get better, in which case I respect that. Cameron Davis? Okay, now this is a profile. There's something here, especially this late in the draft, with the 65 range, the speed profile, and a little bit of a bat, nothing crazy. You know, I'm going to take Cameron Davis. Now, what happens down here, though? Because we were not going to have the negotiation window for a 17th round pick, are we? So I don't even know how to try to pay him what he's going to want. But you know what? Let's give it a shot. Are there any impossible pitchers? There's one. Ridge Morgan. Ridge. His name is Ridge. I'm sorry. What? Oh, he's local to me. Westwood. Austin, Texas. Cool. Hook'em Horns, by the way. Huge game tomorrow against Alabama. My Lions won on Thursday. I'm over the moon on that. I was hoping to go one and one with my two teams. And so I'm guaranteed that at least. Now I'm greedy. I want 2-0. God, it would be so sick to go into Bama and, and pull the dub. They played them tough last year. You know, Bryce Young's not there. I don't know, man. Listen, I've fallen for the Texas' back thing 74,000 times. Uh, I'm, ready to, I'm ready to be hurt again. Like, I do not care. If they win tomorrow, I will lose my shit. By the way, if you're, well, actually, never mind, never mind. I, was, I don't know exactly when this is going to come out. I was saying if it, I was going to say if, if you're watching this on Saturday, uh, the the 9th, come in my stream because I'm going to be streaming all day because my girlfriend's um, on a little camping trip. But like I said, I don't know. This might be coming out early next week on like the 11th uh, or 12th. All right, let's, let's remove the impossibles again. Let's finish this up. It's good to be back in the saddle, though. So, yeah, I've, I've kind of dilly-dallied a little bit, done some classic Spore rambles, but uh, hopefully you don't mind. Get you a little bit of a longer episode here with the draft. We'll do the prospects um, on the next one where we're just kind of go over the farm system, see where that's at. That'll be a tighter episode. And then, like I said, back into the season after that. So back-to-back -back prospect episodes here. I considered doing the draft offline because it was so thin and then um, – uh, then I could have done both things together. That might have been the better way to do it, but I, I wanted to kind of go through the draft. And I know some people like to see thought processes and you know how you're going through s things like that. So maybe there was some value in watching go me go through all of that. I'm looking here at uh, Acosta, the 60 pop randomly at you know pitcher potential we're drafting him as a pitcher uh with the potentially huge change up too but then i see that random 60 pop there and i'm like okay sure this late why not nahomar is that is that how you say it nahomar achoa acosta still there 
Greco is for Dylan Green. And Dylan Green's not a bad, not a bad recommendation here this late. Honestly, I should probably take Tanner Green Dylan Green. Let's do that and then try to get Acosta. Still there. I think that's who we want, right? Look at me pretending that it matters this late in the draft. You can find late gems though. You absolutely can. Uh, we had one in, I want to say the Arizona Sim. It was a last round or second to last round pick. Turned him into a real top 100 prospect. But then he was the linchpin, or not the linchpin. He was the, like the final piece of a deal that uh, we really wanted to get done. And I was like, I was torn about wanting to trade him because he was such a cool late find. And I had to talk myself into like, don't get too hung up on finding somebody late and getting lucky uh, and making, you know, making it cause you to avoid this trade because you're happy that some 19th rounder hit. So eventually I did trade him. I, I don't remember what, what eventually became of that player. Let's take a Costa. Let's finish this up. We got one more pick. The Reco is for Jackson Lynn. High work ethic. Man, if we flip this um, outfield profile, it's 50, 55, 70. If it was 70, 55, 50. Whew. Wait, this is interesting. Wait, 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 wait. It lists his outfield work here. He's listed as a CF, but then here, his position ratings are for second and third only. That's bizarre. I've never seen that. It's kind of perfect timing for the episode to almost be over because I'm pretty much out of water. And I get to talking so much that I got I got to I got to keep the old voice lubricated. I don't know why I said it like that. That just makes it sound weird. What about Anson Siebert? Kind of just solid everywhere. Nothing too crazy. Although, maybe we should take another hitter. We've taken a lot of pitchers. I just think it was a better pitcher draft. And we did get a lot of two ways. In fact, Talon Bell here would be another two way. Pretty decent left fielder. Yeah, I'll take Talon Bell as our last pick. Boom. Auto pick. Draft is over. Siebert, did I, did I see Siebert was still out there? Can we go sign Siebert like immediately? How's that work? I've never really done that. I think that's definitely something that can have some value. You know, there, there's not gonna be that much greatness left. Oh wait, they might've been picked at the very, very end there. Draft long. I thought I saw Anson Siebert's name. Where did we pick? Oh, that, sorry. This is the wrong round. Um, we took Talon Bell there. And then... I don't see Anson Sieber. Oh, maybe they went to college, though. So they're not available as a free agent. Right? Because it, it should only be... Um, it should only be people that don't have college eligibility that would be available for free agency. And frankly, I don't remember... Anson Siebert, yeah, was was a high school guy, and he's going to go to Vandy. We'll keep tabs on him, though. It's not it's not a bad player. The only reason I took Talon Bell was he was pretty similar as a pitcher and had the hitting capability, so I don't regret that. But uh, is there anybody that didn't get drafted that is worth anything? Let's do an age filter of 22. You know, it's not going to be great, whatever it is, and there's certainly no hitters of oh wait wait that's because i'm showing the pictures penile burrito penile burrito a little bit of hitting blah i don't even know if we necessarily need anybody i oh wait but barofen did not get drafted neither did homer bush with that really good outfielding and high work i think you know what i'll take a shot on these two Offer some minor league contracts. In fact, let's just see who on my list didn't get drafted. All right, just those two plus Tim McHugh 
and Michael Brown, uh, plus the ones who went to school, of course, too. These are just the ones who are now free agents and no pitchers. The pitcher list was shorter and we drafted a ton of players from it. Tim McHugh, God, never mind. 30-30 on the uh, contact and avoid K. That's, oh, that's so bad. High work ethic, but I don't know if high work ethic and even, you know, great relationships with the right coaches would be able to fix that. I don't think so. Not at 20, almost 23 years old, 22 and 278 days. What about people that weren't on our short list? Anybody else worth a look here? Again, well, let's look for standout skills. We see Bush is tied for the top outfield range. So we already took a shot on him. Infield range, Rodmar Angela. Oh my God, one of the worst bats I've ever seen in my life. Work ethic and 60 infield range is not enough to make a for it, especially because they can't turn a double play either. I don't know if I've uh, vocalized this uh, on stream or in a video, but I call these players uh, Zoolanders uh, or Blue Steels in my head because they can't turn double play. And if you've seen the movie Zoolander, there's this whole bit about how he can't turn. I think I think it's left. I don't remember which way because I haven't seen that movie in a long time. So if I see a player who has like all the skills like this, the range, air, and arm are legitimately good, but a 20 double play, I'm like, oh, Zoolander. We can't take that Zoolander. All right, yeah, no, we'll, we'll be good with Barofen and, and Bush there. So, oh no, I think it's a pretty good draft here. Oh, we, we can negotiate with Cameron Davis. Okay, so let's see what happens. This was an impossible signing. He would need a bonus significantly above 9 million. Interesting. I don't think we have enough there because we have 13 million in outstanding offers with a draft budget of 13 million. So I don't think that's going to work. Do we have anything extra though? No, we have 1.7 mil. Yeah, I don't think that's going to work because yeah, even if I tried to go crazy here and say, 10 mil, it's gonna get declined. Yeah. We have some time. Maybe we free up some money, but I'm not gonna bend over backwards for Cameron Davis. Took a shot, I just wanted to see what it looks like when you take somebody who's impossible that late. I didn't even know. Um, I mean, there's talent here, but something would have to kind of open up naturally to do that. Did you just unplug the fan? She moved the bed on the cord and it pulled it out. Come here. Let's see how the video as we finish up. All right, y'all. Thank y'all so much for watching here. Uh, this is our draft episode. I think we did a pretty good job. I don't think we're going to end up being able to sign Cameron Davis. We'll do a prospect deep dive next episode where we'll go over the minors see who's doing well check in on our top 100 guys see who might be able to become a top 100 guy soon and then like i said we will continue the season which right now has been excellent so far there's no way around it i don't think it's jinxing or talking too much uh to say that we're 10 games clear of the twins nothing's guaranteed but it's undeniably been a good season so far so we'll see how that goes but thank you all so much for watching thank you for your patience too again i know it's been almost two months to the day uh well again depends when this comes out when i'm recording it it's almost two months to the day since the last video we will not have delays like that to that same degree again but uh, appreciate y'all and back again relatively soon after this one take care